uh, Benny, Lord, and as well as uh, various others, Lord, that we've been praying for. We do thank you, uh, Lord, for those that are getting better. Um, that we've been praying for, Lord, and, and all of these have been in the hospital, and we just pray that Benny would be able to be at home. I don't know if he is yet, but uh, we do pray that he, uh, that uh, you would heal him and touch him, Lord. Um, Lord, we do just uh, pray for the political environment in our country, and uh, we do just pray for those that have suffered greatly through this time of shutdowns. And uh, Lord, I, I do pray for the ability for us to to communicate and for truth to be able to be told, Lord. Um, everything is politicized and it's hard to discern uh, where the truth lies, Lord. And so, one, give us discernment, but two, may we be those peacemakers that allow people to communicate, God. And so help us, give us your eyes, your heart towards those that we may even radically disagree with, Lord, that. Uh, that we may even have insight into their life and minister the truth of the gospel to them that they may be saved, God. We pray for those that are stuck in Afghanistan, Lord. We know that there's some students there as well uh, that are, are stuck there and, and various others. And, and uh, Lord, there's just been a horrible communication between um, Congress who have been hearing from their constituents and the State Department, Lord. And um, Lord, we do just pray for those that are left behind, Lord. We pray... For the Afghan church, Lord, which uh, to this point, the last 20 years, has been one of the fastest growing churches in the world, Lord. And uh, so many Christians left behind. And we just pray that they'd be like the church in China, just serious and strong under persecution, Lord, and that you would protect them. And so we just lift them up to you as well, God. And uh, we do just lift up those that just went under Ida. And uh, the various teams, Lord, Calvary Relief, uh, Bob and Kate with After the, Sh uh, After the Storm uh, for Christ, and various other ministries, God. And we just pray um, that you'd be glorified, Lord, in that. We pray that you guide the hands and you just show great favor on those teams that are going out there to share your gospel, Lord. Samaritan's Purse as well as various others, Lord. May you just, uh, just swing open the doors wide for through tragedy. Um, eternity to peek through and for people to be saved lord and so we do lift that up to you as well god and um just so many other needs lord but we we do want to trust you uh, we want to live obediently and we want to live radically lord for you and uh so even tonight as we're looking at rejection of faith lord may we do the opposite may we embrace our faith in you lord we pe we we're going to see a king double down on stupid, Lord. May we double down on faith and embrace he who knows all you, God. And uh, so just help us tonight. Encourage us. Minister to our hearts, we would pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Over and over, God showed mercy to Ahaz. But Ahaz kept running from God. And what we have in the first couple of, of uh, verses in Isaiah chapter 7, is a, is a summary of just a part of the result of God's mercy to Ahaz. And then we're going to get into the details that led up to this and actually the ramifications of the rejection of faith. And so Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1 reads, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria... And Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. So again, that's a summary of what's happening. Now understand, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is a series of chapters and they deal with different things. And so what a prophet would do is, is he would prophesy over decades, many times major prophets would prophesy over decades and they'd have various different prophecies. And so this is revealing a part of the life of um, Isaiah as he's ministering to the southern king Ahaz. Okay? And, and this is what a prophet did. One of the roles of a prophet was to let the king know what God thought about what he was doing. For God to involve himself in the political leaders to give them direction from him and to actually reach out to bless them. This is what prophets did. 
And my belief is in the New Testament times, in the age of the church, all of us have the Holy Spirit if you're a believer. And so we are all, in a sense, called to be prophets. We are the priests or the mediators between God and man. We're the ones that give the message about what God thinks about what is going on. And we give advice from God, not from our own opinion, right? but from God, and we reach out to people. And so this is what prophets would do. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon a prophet. And so the Lord is speaking through Abraham to this king, Ahaz, right? And, and, and so as he's ministering to this particular king, remember, Ahaz is, is Uzziah's grandson. Uzziah was a good king until the very end, and he failed. He didn't finish well, but he ruled for 52 years, and he was a, a profitable, stable, good king. But Ahaz was not, and he did not hold on to the Lord at all. He was not known as a good king. Now, understand that in the northern kingdom of Israel, they never had a good king <laughs> that God considered good. In the southern king, kingdom, they had a few uh, good kings and some not-so-good kings and then some horrible kings, and so they had a mixture in the southern kingdom. But it says in Second Chronicles 28, 2 about Ahaz, it says, For he walked... In the ways of the kings of Israel. Remember, none of the kings of Israel were good. And made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnon and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. He worshipped false gods. He went after gods that were not gods. Josephus, the historian, says this. He offered up his own son as a burnt offering according to the practice of the Canaanites. And if you go into Israel and some of the digs, you can see that they will find these altars or these high places, and next to them you will find infant bones because very often they'd sacrifice infants after having uh, uh, parties or wild orgies in their services. That's how they, they perform their services. And then nine months later they'd get together and they would sacrifice these infants that came from that unto these particular gods. And he sacrificed his own children. It's interesting, it says, they bur he burnt incense in the valley of Hinnon. Now, the name for hell given to us is Gehenna, related to Hinnon. It's a valley. So, uh, Jerusalem has all these valleys and, and, and mountains, you know, and you have Mount Moriah, and you have Mount Zion, you have these different mountains. It's made up of all these different hills. And so, there's valleys in between, and so all these valleys have names. Well, eventually, after they got away from idolatry, they used Hennon as their garbage dump because they were not proud of their history. But this is where they would sacrifice humans in this valley. Eventually, they made it a garbage dump. Now, remember, the Jews were into the cleanliness laws, and then once they got away from idolatry, they were very ashamed of that. So when hell, the eternal place that, that was made for the angels to suffer, the fallen angels, the demons to suffer... Uh, was named Gehenna, right? And so it's interesting how that works. And so it's an abominable place. And, and this man was not a good man. But understand, God still tried to reach out to him. And, and we need to remember that in this day and age as well. Because in this day and age where things are getting radically evil, the Lord says, woe to those who put good for evil. But for us, it, yeah, it's woe. And so sometimes when people get so evil, I can be angry with them or else I can step back and go, whoa, they need Jesus. Uh, a man that I was speaking to who is very much in the battle in Washington, D.C., I, I asked him one time, I said, how in the world do you smile when these people are just thrashing themselves or uh, just attacking you and trying to thrash you. And, and he said, I need to remember, and this is what I try to do, they're not my enemy. They're slaves of my enemy, and they don't even know it. 
right? And so he has, he has a, a feeling of, of pity, in a sense, for them. And the Lord would tell us, love your enemies, care for them. Not be dumb, don't let them walk all over you in the sense of uh, uh, performing evil against you, but in the sense of just small offenses, yeah, we can turn the other cheek. You know, we can do that. We have that ability. And we need to remember to keep our Christian character in these crazy times of, of uh, you know, Instagram and Twitter and all these other, you know, crazy formats where we can be so brave. You know, someone just told me today, someone was getting on and writing sarcastic things on one of our web pages, and it's just like, I know the person. When I talk to that person face to face, they don't say a word. But when they get online, ooh, they can be so strong. And it's tempting. It's not only tempting to, the, to those that want to uh, do evil, it's also tempting to us who want to do good, isn't it? Because we can hide behind these words and we can be all, all, all radical. But, you know, I don't know if we want to keep God on our side if we should be that way, <laughs> right? And uh, so be careful about being sucked into this. And, uh, and so there's these kings. There's the Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the king of Israel. So Syria is basically the same Syria as today, and, and there is Damascus there. It's, it's still their capital today. But Isaiah is living, li, living during the times of the divided kingdom. So you have the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as its capital, and you have the northern kingdom of Israel uh, with Samaria as its capital. And it is just getting more and more evil, so much so that there's this war between Jews, right? The northern kingdom allies with this pagan kingdom and then attacks the southern kingdom, right? Now, Jerusalem couldn't be taken because the walls were so strong. And you could give credit to that to um, Ahaz's grandfather, Uzziah. He had really built up the walls. And so Jerusalem itself didn't suffer. The whole nation did not need to suffer near as much as it did. But Ahaz continued to push back the protective hand of God. And he didn't want have, to have anything to do with God's protection. Jerusalem did not fall. But the rest of the nation suffered greatly because of this man's sin. Okay? And so those first two verses give us a summary. Jerusalem didn't fall, but the rest of the nation does suffer greatly. So verse 2 goes on to say, And it was told to the house of David, that means Ahaz, he was a descendant of David, Serious forces are deployed in Ephraim. So hear the heart of his, of his people. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees in the woods are moved with the wind. So we're told perfect love casts out fear. And uh, they were fearful because they, didn't, they weren't resting in the love of God. And so they were, they were wavering. And so before the battle took place, they hear the Syrians are now in Samaria. And, and Ephraim is the largest tribe in the north. And, and so they're hanging out. They're getting ready to attack. And they're getting fearful. And so before the attack, they, they hear this. But the Lord sends a prophet. And that's what he does. To strengthen the king. To give notice to the king. To give instruction to the king. The Lord said to Isaiah in verse 3, Go out to meet Ahaz. You and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to them, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, these two smoldering pieces of wood, is what he's saying, right? Don't worry about them, for the fierce anger of resin and of and Syria and the son of Ramalia. And so he tells them, Isaiah, go meet the king. He's going to be out by this reservoir. Why is he checking out this reservoir, this upper pool? Well, he's expecting a siege to come. And so the Israelites protected their water. They were up on a hill. And so they had to make sure that they had the ability 
to protect their water because water doesn't spring out at the top of the hill. It springs out in the valley, and that's where it gathers. And so he's out checking this out, and the Lord says to Isaiah, go meet him there and, and, and tell him this. Listen, obey, don't be afraid, do not be weak, do not be fearful, don't worry, trust in me. It isn't don't worry, be happy. It's don't worry, trust in God. That's what it's about. And so that could apply to us even today as well. We trust. We wait. You know, it's funny. I've been, I've been learning about, um, you know, investing retirement funds. And when you plant a church, you don't start very early to do that because there's no money to do that, right? <laughs> and eventually it's like, oh, I better work on this, you know. So I started working on it a few years ago. And now I'm really learning about it. And uh, I, I keep on, on, on telling Fab, I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to trust in the Lord with this, right? Because you can be so absorbed into the market that every little glitch and every little bump, <gasps> you know, red letters, it means it's dropped. Ah, you know, what am I going to do? And, and what do you do? You pray, you be wise, and you be faithful. That's, that's what you do. You don't freak out over every little thing because you trust in the Lord. You know, does God care more about your retirement account or your character? So if you're showing good character and you're doing your due diligence, you be faithful in the Lord. That's what you do. You know, and again, I shared with you in our announcements, you know, about Bob and Kate. Hey, they're being faithful. And they've looked at a bunch of different trailers and things like that. And if, if this one works out, they were patient, they did it God's way, and they waited and God will God will show up, right? And that's what we do. There's a quarterback named Mike Holgren. He was cut from the New York Jets. He was the backup to Joe Namath back in the day, right? And when he had got cut, he had freaked out because he had sold his life to football. He was a Christian, but football was his God. And when he got cut, he's like, oh, no, what am I going to do now? Well, he decided to recommit his heart to God. He said, I had committed my life to Jesus Christ when I was 11, but in pursuit to make a name for myself in football, I left God next to my dust-covered Bible. But after getting cut from the jets, I pulled out my Bible and found comfort in a verse I'd memorized in Sunday school. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Now, when he was interviewed, and he actually wrote this, as he put God first, he ended up being the head coach for the Green Bay Packers later instead of a backup quarterback behind a superstar. Just trying to be faithful. Whatever, God. But you know what? He would have been just as blessed and just as honored before God in heaven for all of eternity if he ended up a high school coach and did it faithfully. Right? Right? That's the contentment that God brings and the usefulness that God brings. Maybe even more effective, because I think high school kids might listen more than professional football players, likely, <laughs> right? You know, and so you, you just don't, God's accounting isn't our accounting. But what he's saying is be faithful. And so he's offering this to this guy who is worshiping false gods, and he sends Isaiah. Listen, Isaiah, 66 books he gets, to, or 66 chapters he gets to write. A messianic prophet, an incredible prophet, the prophet that was quoted more times in the New Testament than any other prophet, Isaiah. And Ahaz gets Isaiah. He didn't get one of these one chapter wonders, he didn't even get a rebellious guy like Jonah. He got Isaiah to come to him. Does God care about Ahaz? He still cares about Ahaz, doesn't he? So God does promise that as we grow and trust in him more, we'll experience more and more of his peace. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. Hudson Taylor left England and moved not just to China, but to inland China. 
There was a lot of trading on the coast, and it was very Englishized, but inland it wasn't at all. And, and he went, and you know, in those days when you went as a missionary, you would go and you would say goodbye to your family forever because likely you would never see them again. And he went to inland China, and he fell in love with these people, kept his integrity, but he wanted to reach them so, so much that this Englishman, and many times back then, the, the English would go to a South Sea island, and then they'd get a convert, and they'd dress them up in a wool suit with a hat in the, on a tropical island, <laughs> right? But what he said was, God can Christianize any culture. And so he was very famous for actually dressing up and wearing his hair in the same way that, uh, that the Chinese that he was trying to reach did because it wasn't sinful, right? A wool suit isn't uh, necessarily godly. And so he became all things to all people. So he said this, let us give up our work, our plans, ourselves, our lives, our loved ones, our influence, all, our all, right into God's hand. And then when we have given all to him, there will be nothing left for us to be troubled about. If it's all God's and it belongs to God, it's now his problem. In our church over the years, especially, you know, quite a few years ago, especially when we were building this building and, and we had purchased this land and we had absolutely no money. Um, my assistant pastor at the time would come to me. Rod, what are we going to do? We got these bills. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? You're the pastor. You're supposed to know. You're supposed to hear from God. <laughs> you kind of freak out on me. <laughs> and I would say, it ain't my problem. It's God's problem. And he'd go, and I go, listen, who gave us this property? God. Who, you know, who, who led us here? God. You know, five months ago, we knew it was God who gave us this land. It's his problem. And I go, so the only thing we can really do is pray and just ask God when he's going to pay that bill. <laughs> and I would actually sleep at night. And, and, I, you know, and he learned over time, no, nope, we just need to pray about it right? And so that's what we're to do. And the thing about faith is it's not just something that's meant to be static. Faith is an engine. Boom, 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 boom. You're just going to sit it in the garage and listen to it roar? You're going to do something with it. You're going to take that horsepower and get it moving, or are you just going to listen to it? Faith is active. Read Hebrews 11 by faith. By this incredible trust in an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God. By faith, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, on and on and on and on. By faith, they did these things. And then chapter 12, verse 1 goes on to say, And since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, they're not people watching us. We're... We're surrounded or we've had people come before us that witness to God's faithfulness. That's what it is. We have this great testimony of all those that have lived by faith. And we live on a planet and, and we can read books about great faith of those in the past. Faith isn't new. We, have, we, have, we don't have a reason not to have faith. We have a great crowd of witnesses. We have books and books and testimony and history of great faith. Get moving, have faith, let it be active. So again, he, he's telling Ahaz, he's going, Ahaz, you see these people as a fearful thing. I see them as a couple of burnout. Burnouts, that's what they are. They're burnouts. They're, they're, they're smoldering sticks is what he's saying. And don't worry about them. And he goes on in verse 5, and he says, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. 
So these kings create a union. They want to grab the south and they want to put their own king on the throne of David. One, that's not going to happen because God established the throne of David and eventually the Messiah would sit on that throne. Jesus is king, right? So their plan was to punch a hole in the wall and come and destroy Jerusalem. Well, Josephus, again, the historian, writes as Assyrians, and this, this coalition finally gave up trying to break through the wall because the wall had been fortified by King Uzziah. And just like God had promised, they were taken care of. They didn't break into Jerusalem, and they weren't able to set their own king on the throne. Now, it's interesting that God shows his providence and his care for his people, even though King Ahaz was evil. God is patient and merciful, even to those that are evil. The world is sure blessed that I'm not God. Right? You know, the first inkling of something that just ticks me off, it just goes, boom, you know, like you're gone. I just blow them up, right? But God is so merciful. He wants them to repent. He gives them opportunity to listen. And so this King Ahaz has somewhat of a victory, even though he's not trusting in God at all. And so God keeps his word to Ahaz, even though Ahaz doesn't deserve it. Now, God, when he shows kindness or he holds back his hand of judgment, would want us to change just to realize, oh my gosh, God, you're merciful. I, I want to serve you. Romans 2, 4, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's his kindness that leads us to Repentance. And he wants you to turn around. When I look back at my life, I just think, how many times should I have died? How many times should I have been maimed? You know, how many times should I have irreparable irre brain damage? And my wife would say, you, you got it. <laughs> you know, but how many times, you know, when you look back in your life and, yeah, some things have happened to me, but there's so many other times where I deserved it and I didn't get it. And I, I don't want to provoke God and just not recognize the fact that he has been merciful on me. Verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, the capital, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, their king, and, he, and this is a prophecy. Within 65 years, Ephraim, that is the northern kingdom. Remember, the northern kingdom is Israel, but Ephraim is the largest tribe in Israel. So Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, and then the northern kingdom of Israel. But Israel had another name, Ephraim. It says, within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. So not only did I protect you from being completely run over and thrown out as king and protected your city, I am going to punish those who attacked you. It goes on to say in verse 9, the head of Ephraim is Samaria. So they're saying Ephraim is being run by Samaria, the, the, the capital there. And the head of Samaria is Ramallah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So he says, within 65 years, the northern kingdom will be destroyed. So what happened was later, the Assyrians came and they attacked the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom where Ephraim was. So they would spread out the people as they ran and they were taken into captivity and they, they would go all over the Assyrian kingdom. And those that were left were left behind. But what the Assyrians would do is they would move foreign people into the land and they were intermixed with the people there and they were told to do so. 
And so you had these Israelites, and then you had these foreigners coming in with these foreign gods. And so what you ended up with was a morph of Judaism, and then you had a morph of the people, and these became known as the Samaritans. And this is why the Jews in the South considered them half-breeds, right? They, and and their, their religion really was a mixture of many different religions. And this happened 66 years later. So what did he say? In 65 years, this is going to happen. It was factually done 66 years later. They were no longer a people at that point in time. They'd been scattered and uh, intermixed with different nations. But again, in the second half of verse 9, through Isaiah, the Lord says to Ahaz, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. What does established mean? You're, you're not going to be profitable and you're not going to be seen as a good king at all. What else does it mean? It means if you will believe... You shall be established. See how that works? And, and he's giving him another chance, isn't he? This man has rejected God, rejected God, rejected God, and God is still giving him a chance to believe. But since he didn't believe, Second Chronicles 28.5 tells us what happened around him. Therefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. They defeated him and carried away a great multitude of them as captives and brought them to Damascus. Then he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel who defeated him with a great slaughter. For Pekah the son of Remaliah they, uh, killed 120,000 in Judah in one day, all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Zikri, the mighty man of Ephraim, killed uh, Manasseh, the king of the son of uh, Azrakam, the officer over the house of Elkaniah, who was second to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and they also took away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So this king's thinking, oh, Jerusalem is saved. But what happened all around him in the people that he was responsible to? Because he didn't listen to the Lord. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were taken in uh, the spoils of the war happening all around, right? But God still showed mercy to them because Second Chronicles chapter 28 records to us, though, that there was a prophet living in the city of Samaria that convinced the Samaritans to actually release many of these people and allow them to come back into the land and return home. How in the world did that happen? God, having mercy again on his people. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Ahaz should have been, We're, oh my gosh, it's devastating, you know, and Jerusalem's fine, but look at all these people around. It's devastating. And so what ended up happening was God still delivered the people back. He loved his nation. He loved his people, and there was promises to his people that he was going to take care of them, even though their king was faltering. But they could have gotten through it with a lot less pain had this king trusted the Lord. And so what was he doing? Well, he was running from the Lord. And he was trusting the things of the world and the worldly. He was rejecting the things of God. He continued to run from one thing to the next, anything but God. And you look around, and sometimes that happens in people's lives. There's been, we've been here for uh, 24 years this month, actually. I moved here 24 years ago this month. And um, over that time, we've watched a lot of people run from God. We watched a lot of people's children run from God. And it's like, really, you're still holding out. I cannot believe you're still holding out. You've been through all kinds of craziness and craziness and craziness and craziness. And what do you keep on doing? You double down on stupid. But then it's like, wait a second. I can do that too. And I can be tempted to do that. You know? and, and so for me, I've got to be persistently making right choices, godly choices, principled choices, 
in the right direction over a long period of time. That's what we do as Christians, right? Daily, we have choices to surrender to God or to rebel against God. And so we may need to make those choices to walk with God every single day. We need to stop running. We need to stop fighting with God. And then verse uh, 10 goes on through Isaiah. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in depth, in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now, this sounds holy, right? You're not supposed to test the Lord. Deuteronomy uh, 6.16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa or Meribah over the water. The, the, the children of Israel tempted against God. They were complaining about the water. But don't test him like that. And so he's sounding holy. The problem is God told him through Isaiah, test me. God is saying to this guy that has sacrificed his own children, worshiped false gods, totally disobeyed, brought destruction on the land, and he's saying, now are you ready to listen? How can I give you faith? Ask me for a sign, and I will give you a sign. And what does he say? I will not tempt the Lord. What he's really saying is, I don't want to listen no matter what. Unbelief is a powerful thing, isn't it? He just says, absolutely not. And that, what a foolish thing. So he doubles down on his rejection of God. Verse 13, then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but you, will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now all of a sudden it gets into the prophetic, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But again, think about the mercy of God on this, this man. Even though you haven't listened and it caused you great destruction, I returned your people. Now I want to deliver you further. What are you going to do now? Well, I'm not going to listen again. And he's saying, I'm still going to give you a sign even though you don't want a sign. And so understand this. This is a prophecy for Ahaz. Something happened in his kingdom that he would have been aware of. A woman who was a virgin at the time of this prophecy got pregnant in the natural way. She became a non-virgin at that time, right? And had conceived and had a child. And she named that child Emmanuel or God with us. Or with us is God. El means God, so it's kind of backwards in the Hebrew language. With us is God, Emmanuel. But that's one of the titles for Jesus as well, right? Because he was truly God with us. But many times you would say, God is my judge, Daniel. You know, anything that ends in an E-L in Hebrew has God in, in their name. And it's a very common way to, to name your children. But this, this young girl, at the time of the prophecy... Um, gets married, has a child, names her child Emmanuel, right? And this child, so it goes on to say, um, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And the child at 12 years old would come to the age where they would know how to refuse evil because that was the age of accountability for Jewish young men. They would go through their bar mitzvah. They still have these today, right? And so that's when a, a boy becomes a man, right? No teenageism. <laughs> it's from boy, boys to men. No, anyway, so, so it's from, from uh, boys to men at the time of bar mitzvah. And that's considered for them the time of accountability, right? And so that's the time that he's supposed to know uh, good from evil. So, in Isaiah chapter 7, a few other things about this particular boy named Emmanuel.
It says, curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose good, the land that ye dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house. Days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Okay, so this is loaded. Let's, let's uh, pull it apart here. So at 12 years old, something is going to happen. Okay, and it's a sign that God would deliver his people from their enemies, Syria and Ephraim. Right now, when it says this, behold, a virgin will have a child. We also know this has a secondary significance. And again, I keep on reminding you because we're in Isaiah, a book of prophecy, that many times prophecies have two fulfillments, double fulfillment. And we know from Matthew one twenty two, because we read it at Christmas all the time, right? It says, this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So this is sent. This prophecy is fulfilled in the immediate for this king because it was given directly to the king, but it was also sent 700 years afterwards to the time where Jesus was born. Emmanuel, God with us. Now, in that time, the child was born in the natural way. When Jesus was born, he was truly born of a virgin because it was a woman who was a virgin and it was the Holy Spirit who, uh, who um, gave her the, the other half of the DNA. So Jesus Christ is human through Mary and God through the Holy Spirit, the God-man, okay? And so um, this is prophetic, and so this is a sign that you would be protected and that your enemies are going to be wiped out. This is also a sign to us that he's going to rescue us even from ourselves. And again, Emmanuel means God is with us. Verse 15 goes on to say, Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that ye dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Now when it says he'll eat curds or butter and honey, it's not necessarily a good thing. You see, they were an agriculture society, but all their outlying lands have been ravaged. And what has happened is now they only have a few pack animals and farm animals. And the lands have been ravaged. They're not eating bread. And they're not eating all these other things out of the vineyards. They're actually eating uh, basically um, cheese, right? And honey. Well, where does the honey come from? Well, all these, all these uh, fields are now overgrown. And, and where do you get honey? You get honey from bees, right? And so you, you basically are going out in the wild and getting honey. There's so few people that are left in the land after it's been ravaged, that um, they're able to eat of the very few livestock remaining, but they can't even farm. There's not enough to get farming done. But this child, it's significant that this child has a certain age where this is going to start to happen. It says in verse 17, the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house Days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So you're going to have this, this time and this child's going to grow up. But then what's going to happen is now the Assyrians are going to come and they're going to attack you. And they're going to lay siege against you. And it's going to be a horrible time. This happens during the time of King Hezekiah. So we get this idea that, you know, Israel was just hanging out, hanging out, hanging out. And God warns them and then Babylon comes and wipes them out. No. Because of disobedience, they just struggled, they struggled, they struggled, and they struggled. The stories would be much different had they trusted in God along the way. And that's what all the prophets were sent to do. I'm warning you, I'm warning you, I'm warning you. And many times when we find ourselves in a pickle, we've had a lot of warning signs, haven't we? And we've just rejected them, and now we find ourselves in a very bad spot. 
It happens in marriages. It happens in, in some of our jobs. If you look around, you don't take care of your house. It happens to your house, <laughs> whatever. You know, when we start to neglect things or we neglect the, the warning signs of where we're going, we, we can find ourselves in big trouble. Now, the interesting thing about Assyria is the Jews had asked the Assyrians for helps. Judah had asked Assyria for help against these people. But Assyria ends up attacking them. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, and they will come, all of them, and rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks and on all thorns in all the pastures. So again, he asks Assyria for help, but eventually Assyria turns on them. And there was a point in time in Israel's history where Egypt and Assyria were battling. You know it's halfway between Egypt and Assyria? Israel. <laughs> and they were there. And it talks about the thorns and the briars, but the Lord calls them in, and this again is a punishment for Judah not being faithful to the Lord. Verse 20, in the same day the Lord will shave the hired, with a hired razor, a barber, <laughs> with those from beyond the river and with the kings of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and will also remove the beard. It shall be in that day that a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and it shall be from the abundance of milk that they give that they will eat curds. For curds and honey, everyone will eat who is left in the land. And so they come into the land. They start wiping out the people. They start capturing the men, and they start shaving their head and their legs to shame them. And that was a way to shame in the ancient culture. And again, all they were left was with a few herds because they didn't have the ability to farm at that point in time. Verse 23, it shall happen in that day that wherever there could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it will be for briars and thorns. All these beautiful lands that you once had manicured and used for great profit are going to be full of just wild bushes. With arrows and bows, verse 24, men will come there because all the land will become briars and thorns. And to any hill which could be dug with a hoe, you would not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but it will become a range for oxen and a place for sheep to roam. Again, Ahaz had a chance to change course, and he refused. We need to really, honestly and factually, give God a chance. And not just in theory. Yesterday, I was, uh, had, got to have a meeting with uh, our congressman, and he shared with a few of his pastors. And he was saying, one of the things that's wrong with our world and certainly wrong with our country is we as Christians say we have incredible faith in this incredibly powerful, all-knowing God. And then what do we do? We protect ourselves surround ourselves and never take steps of faith. We try to live the safest life we ever can, or that, that we ever could, right? And I, I've always thought that, you know, as someone that's into kind of alternative sports, I always thought Christians ought to be like the best motocross people, the best extreme skiers, the best surfers, because you go for it, you win, or you die. You can't lose, <laughs> you know? But what do we do? We're very fearful. We hide out, and we're not willing to do radical things. You know, it's interesting because in Syria, some of, some of the problem the State Department is having is with missionaries who don't want to leave. You haven't heard that story, have you? But these are Christians who get it, right? Who say, let's go for it. So what am I saying? I'm, uh, 
I'm just saying small steps of faith, and God will show you your bigger steps of faith. I'm not saying, you know, this is Rod's design on your life. You know what steps of faith are for you, right? But what's wrong with giving up a vacation to go on a mission trip? I was talking about how blessed we are as Americans. And my wife and I, we, we love to sponsor missionaries, and we, we sponsor missionaries a lot. And, you know, when I do our taxes, I'm really blessed that, that we end up being able to give to a lot of missionaries. And you know what? It's not even sacrificial for us. But I know we give more than a lot of people, percentage-wise, of our finances to missionaries. And it, it doesn't hurt us. We still go out to dinner. We still buy the stinking three and four dollar coffees, right? I, it's just it's just crazy. And, and so, really, honestly, and factually, give God a chance. And I don't want to just throw this out you and know, say, "Oh, Pastor, I've got to you know go full on." No. But tomorrow, say, God, how do you want me to live in faith? And you know, he knows you and he loves you. And he knows, how to, he knows how to give you those baby steps. Or he knows how to take you back to those bigger steps. He's not a bully and he's not mean. Because the thing is, by stepping out in faith, you're not going to go, I hate this. You're going to go, I love this. To live in faith to see what God would do. How did the guys in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 get there? By taking steps of faith, right? And that's what God calls us to do. How did David become David? He was a shepherd boy taking care of a bunch of sheep. So God worked him into being ultimate warrior of the ancient world by having him take care of sheep. He knows how to move us along. But he's not a bully and he doesn't force you along the way. He just asks you, you going to walk with me today? You're going to take steps of faith with me today. What is God asking you to do? I remember when I felt God calling us out to Corpus Christi. I was in a very large church. And so many people, when they heard what I was doing, they would say, I can't do that. I can't do that. I, I'm so proud of you. You're, you're, take, you're, you're, you're taking your family halfway across the country. I'm like, I'm going to America, right? <laughs> like, it's probably a greater step of faith for a Texan to move to California than for a Californian to move to Texas, <laughs> Texas right? <laughs> but uh, my goodness, so many people like, oh, what? And I'm just like, all you do is you're obedient the next day. And it's just another step. And eventually God gets you where he wants you to go. Right? Yeah, you know, I have people say, oh, pastor, you're never leaving Corpus Christi, are you? I'm like, I don't know. But here's my goal. I want to be willing to take a step of faith whenever God asks me to. See what I'm saying? I want to take those steps of faith. Honestly, in reality and factually, I want to give God a chance. Psalm 134, verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Taste it. Do it. Step out in faith. A highly educated speaker spoke to a group of young people. And he sought to convince the crowd that Jesus was not who he said he was and that the Christian faith was a farce. And after he was done addressing the very Christian crowd, they were shocked. They were mostly younger people. And then he asked if there were any questions. So an uneducated older man walks up to the mic eating an apple. Chomp, chomp, chomp. And you have this guy that's just full of himself up there. And he's patting himself on the back, trying to ruin people's faith. So this simple older man comes up and he says, I have a question. As he continued to crunch his apple. And he asked the man, the speaker, the educated speaker. 
Let me ask you something. Is this apple I'm eating sweet or tart? Chomp, chomp, chomp. And the educated lecturer answers, well, there's no honest way I could answer that. I haven't tasted your apple. And the older uneducated man simply stated, neither have you tasted my Jesus. The thousand people in the auditorium could not contain themselves. They erupted with applause and cheers as the educated speaker left the venue. And the point is this, it's not, it's not that Christianity isn't based on any factual things either. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's all by faith. Well, it's, it's faith and knowledge, right? It's all faith and knowledge, but everything that we do is based on faith and knowledge. But the point is this, he hasn't known Jesus. Ahaz never knew the faith of God. He never tried it. And it led ultimately to his destruction. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Step out in faith and see that he answers prayer and respects faith. Many claim to live radical lives for Jesus, but live the safest lives they can. They protect themselves in the flesh while they're claiming to live in the faith. So what does God want you to do? You know know it's a, a good step of faith? When you're at work tomorrow or wherever you might be, Someone complains about something or or shares about a hurt in their life, go, and just, can I pray for you? Is that a step of faith? Now, for some of you, that might be a giant step. For others, it might be a baby step. But something like that, just, why not? It opens the door. It opens the door. I can't tell you how many times the door is opened for me to share the love of God with people by just going, "Mm, I'll take that step. I'll take that step. I'll take that step. And when you're faithful with the small things, what does God promise to do? Greater things, right? More and more and more. Know the Lord, trust the Lord, pray and walk in a radical obedience and faith. Hopefully you got that simple message. As I, was, as I was digging through this, again, this study took me a long time to prepare because I was trying to figure it all out, right? It's a pretty complex study, but I think the message ultimately is clear. When you trust God, when you trust God, you're, you're, you're making your problem his problem. And it's not like the whole monkey on the back thing. He wants you to trust him with your problems. And when you say no, you're being like Ahaz. But when you're saying, yes, Lord, here I am, send me, like we saw in the previous chapter, you're being more like David. You're being more like Paul. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you, uh, Lord, just in the details, even this prophetic passage that had double fulfillment, God. Just your faithfulness to an unfaithful man, Lord, and we want to be faithful. May we just trust that even as we strive to be faithful, Lord, that you're there even more because we seek to be obedient and at times are very obedient, God. And so may we just trust in your goodness, your faithfulness, your love, your wisdom, your understanding, your compassion, your power. So we love you, Lord, and this world needs what you have planted in us, Lord. Help us to go out and Shine your light in this world. Forgive us where we don't. Give us faith where we're, we're fearful, Lord. Lord, we, we would pray that even tomorrow there'd be an opportunity for us to take that step. And it'd be very obvious, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Let's close with a song.